git and will manage to somehow update uh, the, the system and show the slide. So uh, the server setup, all you need to do is you also have the cloned info screen, info screen uh, repository at the server. And you can just git pull this uh, address. And then this is the runner script. So all you have to do is you, hold, you have to call Cantinfo with the path to the directory of your content, of your slides. And then it will just run continuously and also handle new slides and so on. Uh, we support HTML files, uh, pictures, videos. You can also just uh, have a file called something something dot URL, and then it will find out how to show that. Uh, you can also have shell scripts in case you need some more complex uh, features. We use that at work. Uh, so you can also configure a slide. Should it uh, last 20 seconds, 20 minutes? Uh, should it only be, only be shown on certain, on certain days, on certain intervals? Uh, should it only be shown with a probability of 0.5 or uh, 0.2 or so on? So in conclusion, uh, this is contained for on GitHub, and it works quite well. We have had it battle tested in two different locations on, on four screens uh, for more than two years now, and it's surprisingly stable. It's just a single Python program. So thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and the next speaker is Piotr. using the headset instead if you want to show so okay hi everyone uh, my name is Piotr and together with my colleagues we've spent last three years developing the open source project it's now it's closed but we plan to open source in born hack but the fun was too great, <laughs> so we need to postpone to the upcoming week. Uh, okay, so this is the application management system. Uh, it's not strictly pure technical one. It uh, combines the release management function, uh, orchestration function, deployment function, uh, together in one open source app. So what is that? Uh, application orchestrations. Who, when, what, how, deployed to the production, staging, QA environment, because uh, you should be able to know uh, what is going on in the infrastructure. Sometimes release manager needs to put on hold some release due to some bugs. Sometimes sales guy should know that new red button feature is coming in December because he needs to talk about uh, in the sales presentation. So this is application orchestration. And deployment. Deployment just get the files and put on the server. Sounds easy, but it's not uh, at all. Uh, we are using uh, Ansible roles as a deploy steps, so you can combine deployment pipelines uh, with roles, uh, Ansible roles, existing roles, so you don't need to write your own, maybe you already have some roles. And uh, last, release management, uh, if there's a release with incorporation, maybe there's some dependency for other feature between the features, maybe you need some approvals from other department, so thanks that you can you can cover that. Few words about infrastructure, and uh, looks huge, but uh, it's really simple. The core thing here is application. Application is the heart of the system, so everything is around the application. Application could have environments, it's obvious. Uh, artifacts, artifacts on the left are just uh, files, packages, like uh, package with your web app, whatever, Node.js, something like that. And uh, application could have the change. Change is just deploy the read, red button on production, 
you set up the date, how to do that using the deployment pipelines on the, on, on the right. What is crucial here is uh, you could use only a few of the components that you really need. Maybe you don't have uh, need for the deployment at all. You just want to track the versions. It's possible. You can just register a version, set that this version was deployed to the production or to the staging, whatever, without putting any files. You have your working deployment solution currently? Great. You can just re register the results uh, here in, in, in input it. To know what version is running uh, where. Okay, so now I will show you some really short examples. Okay, looks good. So the first one uh, will just create the application. Where's my mouse? I will copy paste the comments. So the put it core uh, is the core system with uh, open AAP. So uh, you, it's just AAP. And we need the command line tool to talk to the AAP. You can write your own because it's REST AAP. Uh, we write command line in pure bash just for fun because uh, then everyone should be able to extend our command line tool. So creating the apps in our system is, oh, I didn't copy it, sorry. It's hard to do it one hand, but. Okay, I will put the microphone down. Okay, the application has been created. Let's check that out. Some uh, ugly bash table, but uh, you can always add JSON switch. And this is what you got. And every output could be turned into a nice JSON output. Now we'll try to add some version. So we are fully supporting uh, uh, semantic versioning. As you can see uh, on the end of the command, I've just specified that the next version is major. OK, let's list the application. So now we got two versions, 0, 1, and 2. Let's add some uh, dummy environment. It will allow us to set the deployment status. OK. Product environment register. And now the last part, let's, let's tell the application that deployment on the production was successful. So some debug output. We don't have time to talk about it. And let's check out the deployment result here. So. You can see that it was successful. Uh, I can clear the screen. And OK, now. Now is my better. So this is like 3% of uh, our uh, features. Uh, we'll open it in next week. So write me an email if you'd like to know more and watch the GitHub and Hacker News about the, about the system. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we do. You want to bring my, uh, the okay. slide should be on there. Okay, fine. There's one of uh, these. Um, uh, they are online, so. Oh, it's online, excuse me. The browser is uh, running. Yeah. Okay, please welcome Hanno. This does not support proper full screen, but okay. Um, do you use PGP emails? Who uses PGP? 
Yeah, uh, still, you haven't given up. Um, do you also sign your emails? Like, uh, da, da, da. so, you know, yeah, you can sign emails, and that kind of shows that you're in possession of the private key that has signed this email, right? So here's a signed email. This looks legit, right? Do you all think this looks legit? I mean, it's in Thunderbird. It says, good signature from Bob. So anyone seeing anything suspicious here? So it's actually not a signed email. Uh, it's an HTML mail, and I've just added a picture here which says, good signature from Bob. Um, so, um, <laughs> this is a signed email, this is real, and this is a fake. Have you seen the difference? This was quick, right? So, can I, so there is a small difference, which is this whatever red letter thing here, but I, I would say most people would fall for this, right? <laughs> um, but, um, I'm not sure how many people here use Thunderbird. Maybe some people use Matt. This looks also legit, right? It says uh, signature made Saturday something, blah, 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 following data assigned. That looks also very legit, right? Uh, it's also fake. Yeah, of course, I've just pasted in the text here into the email. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that was kind of it. Um, I guess uh, the problem here is that uh, people display the information about the signature within the email, which is obviously controlled by the person sending the email, particularly if, if you have something like HTML mails where you can design them however you want. Um, I reported this to Enig Mail. They have now changed it, so they have switched around the header, and like now th this would go above that, which would make it more obvious. Um, but yeah, yeah. I don't want to say it. You lost your hearing all advanced now. I forgot what to say. Can you? So this is your talk? No. Okay. If, yes. if you want to, um, if you want to be in in the camera and so on, you maybe you would like to use this chair standing or not. Um, well, you can also be on this one. Besides this one, if you want. And then stand there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, please welcome Colin on the stage. Thank you. In this talk, we're going to be talking about diplomacy AI. Thank you. So in two-player games, AIs beat humans fairly comprehensively now. So chess, this is 20 years ago. Go more recently with AlphaGo. Um, poker is interesting because it's a game of incomplete information. So as such, one player doesn't know everything that the other player knows. In that sense, it's unlike uh, chess or Go. So these are more complex games. But even in poker, bots are, are beating top humans now. Um, Dota 2 uh, is an interesting game for the 21st century generation. 
So last year, OpenAI was beating a top human professional in the one-on-one -on -one mode with a particular character in Dota 2. Um, this year, the OpenAI bot is beating humans in 5v5 mode. Um, it played against four former professionals and one commentator and, and is winning now. So even in one year, there's very rapid progress being made. Felix? Uh, we're wondering if I can also do it with another plum, uh, and a game called Diplomacy. It's a board game that has seven players. It's a game like Risk, but there's no, uh, there's no, nothing random about it. So, uh, you can like support other people and their units. You can convoy them also, uh, like like they're yours, and you can talk with people uh, by yourself and also in a group, but, or, uh, but you don't have to do what you say. You can like say that you will support them, but then you can actually backstab them. So one of the challenges posed is that unstructured natural language processing plays a central role in, in games of diplomacy. And also it has more than two players. And so the question of which ones to ally against, with and against are, are important. So there is a, um, there is a diplomacy league. Um, every year, the automated negotiation agents uh, competition has a diplomacy. This is, ANAC has been running since 2010. And for the last two years, they've been running a diplomacy league. Um, this year, it was in Stockholm, in fact, earlier, in fact, last month. Um, last year, the winner was a bot called Frigate, um, which, was, which was designed by two researchers at the Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology. This year, there was no winner. Um, and that was interesting. The, the rules for this year were that to get to the second stage, you first, your bot had to outperform a random bot with, with statistically significant difference. All bots that outperformed this random bot were then play against each other. So only one of the submissions, in fact, outperformed the random bot, and it didn't do very well when playing against the full. So I think having only one entrant that made it past the first stage, they then ran the second stage with all of the bots, and the bot that got past the first stage didn't do well against the, against the full array of bots. So you're playing against bots. You're not playing against humans, and the bots have been hard-coded rather than displaying any true learning. Um, so hard, and, and they're they're hard-coded in a very greedy style as well. So, for example, the 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 ANAC League focuses on negotiations rather than movements. But the sort of hard-coded rule that one of these bots would have is accept any proposal that gives me a net increase in the supply centers that I control. So these are very myopic and they're very simplistic. So the state of the art in this area is still very primitive. And as a result, we would still like to see a bot that can play and maybe even beat humans in diplomacy. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Are there any questions? Yeah. What is your relation to the project? Um, what's our relation to the project? Why are we doing this? Because we like diplomacy. <laughs> yeah, we visited the researchers um, in Tokyo as well. And, and so I, I, I thought it was interesting to see what the low level of the state of the art is. And it seems that this would be a great challenge problem for people interested in natural language processing and in AIs. Um, as I say, most of the, the environments that we've seen tend to be two-player games, so this, this kicks it open, and it's a classic board game as well. So it strikes me that there should be more attention focused on this than there is at, at present. Thank you. Okay, now we can welcome Morten. And just a second. Awesome, we are running. <coughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Morten. 
I'm talking to you guys. Um, the thing is that uh, we are starting up our PBA in IT security um, next year in Odense. And um, hey, we want friends. So, I'm me, I live in, um, in Fyn. I have been teaching um, at the uh, Academy, I don't even know what they're called in English anymore, EAL, Erhvervs Academy Lillebelt. We are called something new now because we merged. Who knows? And I teach um, AP degree students, which is um, an, um, um, uh, an education after high school. So this is, would be the first two years of a bachelor in other places. But uh, and we also have these uh, top ups for bachelors. And um, I do Linux networking, IT security, and Python. Should anyone feel like talking to me about those things? I like to talk about that. Anyway, just to um, I thought that. Given the audience, perhaps uh, all these acronyms might be relevant to mention. Um, ITS, IT security, you probably know what that is. Uh, but the PBA is a professional bachelor. It's, um, um, in Denmark, we have this system where we have uh, uh, AP degrees, we have bachelor degrees, we have master degrees and PhDs and probably something else. Um, and the academic bachelor is probably the ones you know the best. They are the ones that uh, universities make. But we make uh, professional bachelors, which are, um, we like to think of them as being more close to uh, the industry and being able to do a lot more practical, hands-on thing as opposed to uh, a lot of theory. So a PBA, a professional bachelor in IT security would be a practical working person who knows how to do IT security in, uh, what's it called, uh, in a company and not all these nitty-gritty uh, how to do uh, crypto algorithms, for example. So, <clears throat> um, as I said, we are starting this up in uh, Odense in, uh, next year, but it is already running in um, Odense and uh, Copenhagen, so this is actually something where you, act you should be able to find candidates soon that um, has this education. And then uh, just a quick um, overview of what they're doing. This would be three semesters, 90 CTS points if you're into this world. Something about introduction to IT security, IT governance, system security, network and communication security, advanced IT governance, software security, and then uh, you have all the electives and um, internship and a final project. So, as you can see, uh, if you find some guy who knows these things, you're probably uh, well suited to do security in a company. And that is basically the goal of it. Um, so, the thing is that when we start doing these things, we of course start discussing a lot amongst ourselves. Hmm, what kind of stuff should we... So when we talk network security, what is that and so on. And since we are an academy, we want to collaborate with companies. And so, we call the closest big company and they say, Oh yes, we are doing Windows, we are doing VMware and we have a Palo Alto firewall. Therefore, you should teach your students that. And I will then go to my boss and say, oh, we have talked to people in the local area, and they say VMware, Windows, and Palo Alto, so let's do corporate America education. Um, um, yes, and then uh, I start looking for a new job. Because this is uh, very cool, and from a an, um, teacher point of view, this is actually quite interesting, all the stuff you can get for free from these guys. You get 90% discount on hardware and all kinds of really cool shit. So, from a resource perspective, being a teacher, this is the easy way. And, yeah, um, that's not what I want to do. So, in my opinion, the, quick, the big question is, since we don't want to do the corporate America way, what the hell do we want to do? And we need help. We need to have no companies. We need to know people who wants to help us build this education so that we are going to make some really kick-ass professional bachelors in IT security uh, coming out of EAL and Odense. So basically, we want to know people who, takes, um, uh, uh, who take security seriously, who actually use it, or actually work with it in a good way. So, Please come to us and we will do all this internship, we will do collaborations, we will do projects for you, we will do whatever we want, as long as it's uh, in the domain of this um, security. So, come talk to me, especially if you're in the Fyn region, that would be best. Yes? It's blinking.
Uh, good afternoon. Let's see, should be some. Um, I'll have two short talks. Um, yeah, can I start? Yeah. Um, one about uh, diff. <coughs> I guess many of you use uh, use Git or otherwise other versioning systems. At least you use diff tools. Someone that doesn't use a diff tool. Um, where, where's the full screen? Ah. Um, uh, I thought uh, I had a bit of problems with diff. Uh, if if you have a bit more complicated diffs, they easily get very hard to read, and you can use side by side diff tools, and it makes it a bit easier to compare the files, but even on a on a single screen on a, from a terminal, it there is a lot of improvement. I saw a lot of chances for improvement. So, uh, for example, when there's white space changes, easily gets unreadable. Things are shifted. Uh, small changes are hard to see. It, it uh, normally a diff list only the the different lines, and you don't see any of the a small changes if there's uh, especially if there's also white space change or something and things move around and uh, if you have m lines with only a matching bracket or only else those lines often match up with other lines because they are double uh, they they often they are quite often in a file so they match up with the wrong uh, line um, so what I did is make an improved diff algorithm. Uh, it has been on my computer for a few years, but now I thought, ah, it's born heck, uh, what can I do? Maybe it's a good time to finish this algorithm and uh, put it online. Um, what I did, um, I made some changes. I used the Pachance algorithm from uh, Pam Cohen to, as a start, and uh <coughs> It made a bit uh, some changes, so white space get less influence. Repeated characters have less influence. Short lines are uh, uh, short and duplicate lines; they are n not counted. Um, and also to make it more visible, the output. The if you have a block of code and another block of code, you can uh, uh, normally first the one is put and then the the other, the the deleted one and the added one. Um, what I did is interleave them so you can see line by line the difference. And then in the, those lines, the unchanged parts are displayed in gold. So this is a, a diff just as Git outputs it. It doesn't matter what algorithm you use in this case. You see that uh, it's very hard to see what's the difference. There are some part deleted and a part other than there's one line that's the same, then there's a few things changed. Another line that's the same, but those lines that are the same are not really interesting lines. They, they, they appear more times, and else, of course, appears a gazillion of times in a file. Um, so, with my new algorithm, the, the algorithm, this is the output. So you see that actually everything, almost everything, is gold. So it's the same. There's a word added, a word change there. There's a line. Uh, there's an underscore deleted, there's a bit of text added, here's a bit of text added. For the rest, it's all indent changes. Um, that gets a lot more information than there is uh, <coughs> uh, one other tool that you can use because there's other already other improved diffs. Like in Git, you can use word diff makes already a le lot less uh, garbage than the, than the standard diff algorithm, but also this is not super useful and it's also not a compatible diff. It's you can't use this as a patch, uh, for example. Um, so I called it Klondike diff. Klondike is a version of Pachans, so I thought matches. Um, it's written in Python now. It in, uh, integrates well in Git as an external diff tool. 
uh, it's a lot slower than the in internal diff tool in uh, in Git, so that could be improved, but uh, it's waiting a second uh, for a, a, a bunch of patches is also not a huge problem. So it works quite well, um, but it would be really nice to implement it uh, in other tools, in graphical tools, and also make it faster. So if someone cares to join, please. <coughs> Hmm, so then I have another talk about something completely different. And there should be a mini jack somewhere here. Yeah. <coughs> Is there... Uh, yeah, sound. So um, <coughs> this is, uh, I'll open a different, uh, different presentation for the convenience. Uh, this is a project I'm working on now for a long time. Um, uh, it's a music instrument. <coughs> this is my latest version, which is way simpler than the version I started with. The version I started with is a, it's a self-contained box with synthesizer and uh <coughs> keyboard and amplifier inside, so it works by itself. And this, finally, after a few years of, uh, of developing, I thought, <coughs> let's make it simpler for myself and uh, focus only on the, on the main important part, the keyboard, which is the main, main improved thing. Especially since, in the meantime, since 2009 I started on this, other tools became available, like an Axolotti, the keyboard uh, synthesizer board, um, it's an uh, intuitive instrument, it's expressive and portable, small. Um, it's intuitive, mainly the, the, the node layout is the thing that started this project, which is a, a, a logical, intuitive load layout. And for the rest, expressive and portable. I'll keep it short, it's over here. And in the history, there have been quite a lot uh, of new node layout, mainly early in the 20th century or the uh, end of the 19th century, uh, people experimented with other node layouts, which then then a linear piano. In the end, uh, the, the piano won it sort of, but it's quite limited. It's uh, you have to learn every scale new. It has a different shape, uh, and uh, also you are stuck to the 12 tone tuning with with uh, with a uh, with a piano uh, they tuned pianos differently in the back in the 18th century but that created problems because there's 12 notes and <coughs> 12 keys per octave so that's uh, yeah here's some attempts to to have other keyboards most of them have a lot of keys you see um this node layout is uh, these, uh, based on the circle of fifth, which is a, a base in music theory and the pitch height. So you have the circle of fifths, the pitch uh, height, and if you put notes on the uh, on the uh, on the lines, and the, then you will get this layout. Simple idea. It creates a sort of sort of rectangular, sort of hexagonal layout. Um, <coughs> similar things exist, but uh, not not orthogonal. Um, the nice thing of this layout is that it's uh, isomorphic. Every uh, every musical thi uh, distance has the same uh, same shape. So, for example, a, a minor a minor uh, third 
is always this, a uh, major chord is uh, always this triangle, minor tri uh, chord is uh, this triangle. <coughs> and it works with uh, different tunings. So if you, for example, now I set it to a 31 note tuning, in a, 30, in a 12 tone tuning, the B flat and the A sharp, the they are the same. In this button, in this note layout, they are located on different sides. The sharps are here and the flats are here. They sound the same. In a 31 note tuning, they are different. Which makes that uh, a third is way cleaner than in a than in a 12 tone tuning. We are quite used to 12 tone tunings, so uh, uh, we don't hear it as good as Indians do, for example, who are used to clean tunings. Um, and it's, it's quite com compact. With one hand, you can span four octaves or something. Uh, I also modified my accordion to have the same layout. I started actually on acoustic instruments, and then I got into electronics and made an uh, electronic instrument because that makes more space. It's also expressive. All the buttons, they are uh, three directions, uh, sensitive in three directions. Um, <coughs> it runs on a SDM microcontroller. Uh, yeah, without fab labs, I wouldn't have made uh, it have wouldn't have been possible for me to learn all the stuff I needed for this. <coughs> okay, um, yeah, and I used only open software. I try to use only open source software, of course, for this world, of course. <laughs> um, demo video you can see on the website. <coughs> uh, uh. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Do you have that? <laughs> I have this play port. No, I have uh, VGA, yeah, VGA is okay. Okay. Yeah. You'll introduce yourself, Linksys. Yeah. Hello, I'm Linksys. I'm uh, working on a lot of hardware-related problems, and uh, yeah, I, there was some some time when I uh, got done with some other phones which broke down, and now I had to buy a new phone. And yeah, somehow I I bought a Huawei phone because I thought, okay, I got a Qualcomm-based phone, I got a MediaTek-based phone, what's, what's left there? What, what can I try out um, on, on mobile phone uh, chipsets? Um, so I basically bought a new phone and uh, before I just try out, tried out to find the kernel sources of the, uh, of the phone and it did not look so much ugly, there were there were already quite a lot of sources. Even some parts are upstreamed. So I thought, hmm, give it a try. Um, let's see what's what's there. So um, because I like to have my own 
binaries on my phone, so I was really want to have my own Android on it, but it did not work out, and in the end I thought, hmm, should I take the Huawei's Android, which asked me a lot of permissions, or should I just take out a random binary from a forum? And I took that one, but I didn't have so much updates, so I had to, uh, I really went back to, to compile the things. And so usually if you have Android, you have first to unlock the bootloader and get somewhere this cookie, uh, this code. Uh, it would be nice to have it just in the same box, but usually you have to go to the website and um, then you can flash you can flash your image via the bootloader, which is accessible via USB. And um, But my Android did not work. I just see a black screen. What should I do? So usually if, if I'm, I'm also working on on uh, routers like Freifunk and OpenWRT, so there's always a serial where you can get some output. But where is it on the phone? Um, I did not found it. I just disassembled it, went with the oscilloscope and tried to find it, but it did not work out that way at least. And so I had a phone, I could go back to Huawei's operating system or even that one from the phone. I have no idea why that one worked, but mine not. But without just seeing black, it wasn't good. So yeah, does the Linux kernel boot? Maybe. Maybe it's just missing other parts. Yeah. So. I created a backup and uh, went back to start experimenting with partitions. So I don't know if somebody had already seen what's, what kind of partition such a phone has. I mean, when computers started with the old DOS days, we had four partitions, but then we evolved a little bit. And so this is the partition table of, of the phone. So. Uh, yeah, you see a lot of partitions. Uh, likely it's 42, so maybe they, that was the reason to get up there. Um, but for Android, usually you, you, ha you have those three partitions as important. Uh, this is the rescue system. Usually you have some rescue system, which also Android uses as uh, import. And yeah, here's uh, the Linux kernel, and here's the user space, basically. So uh, this is the user space, and yeah. But let's see, it's not all. Um, I basically modified this thing because I said maybe that does not match my Linux kernel. Um, but there are also other interesting. This is the bootloader. And this thing, it's called factory reset protection. And those are also some quite interesting ones. Um, so, but... How did I done it? I, my bootloader does not allow me to directly modify it. I have to boot into the recovery, and then I could modify the image. And But what then happens? I have now a complete black phone. I can't even boot to the recovery after all. Even the recovery should be there for recovery, but nobody thought about, hmm, somebody want to play with more about it. and. So because I had a backup, I could look into look into the bootloader and find out what maybe there happened. I even found out how to get the serial. I haven't tested if it's working, but I, there's a way to get it out of the USB data ports, actually. And But then I also found out how the fastboot OEM basically works. So it's basically just a SHA-1 on one of the partitions saved. It's called user key. And there's also this reset protection, which uh, yeah, which prevents me from doing more with over the bootloader, which basically works the same way, but somehow they did the different things. This is uh, some algorithm, which is a password key diversion, and it's uh, you 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 use it from your from your uh, hard drive de decryption, but it seems to be not enough to just do it. They even have signed the result in the same partition, no idea why. Yeah, so that was my talk. Um, I found more out, but the time is already over. Yeah, so.
Cool. I'm ready. Hello, beautiful people. So, uh, I want to present to you uh, our network management tool that we have uh, made uh, in some Ponies co Collaborative. Basically, if you are tired of Network Manager or if you are tired of uh, W uh, whatever whatever or all the other Network Managers that are pretty shit for Linux, then we will present you a simple alternative that will handle probably whatever you will need on your desktop or laptop computer and also make you not pull your hair out when you need to connect to a new network. Uh, we have the GitHub page, uh, at ponies slash net. It has a fairly, it has fairly good documentation. It's pretty self-contained and self-explanatory in regards to um, the, when you run the command, you can have a help command and we have some example configurations with all the options that are possible within this tool. It's very simple to use. A quick example that I have here my, well not my, but an example version of the config. We have, this is uh, formatted in YAML and we have a common field with which is the, uh, uh, which is options that will fall through all the different kinds of profile you will define. So you can, for example, uh, globally set uh, that you would like to have a random MAC address, uh, or you could just set that your MAC address, sh MAC address should be an NSA MAC address, because why not? Um, your global DNS settings, global host name, stuff like that. You can also set a global interface, so you don't have to type out what uh, interface your profile wants to use all the time if you only use your Wi-Fi interface. Uh, you can set the ignored interfaces so the tool won't uh, use them at all, which is pretty handy. O otherwise, it might be confused because sometimes we are trying to guess what it is you're trying to do and do some magic so you don't have to type out everything if, it's, if, it's, if you're able to uh, know what it is. If we can re basically read your mind, we will do it for you. You can define different kinds of profiles. You can define a v v VPN profile, so you can handle all your open VPN or Wireguard VPN configuration through the tool. This is an example. These keys are valid, but this is not a valid address, so it's not a valid entry. Um, you can f we have a cer some certain profiles that are pretty static, like the Wired. So the only thing that I have defined for Wired is my Wired interface, which basically means I haven't defined anything else. All the things from common will fall through, and then it will pick some sane defaults otherwise. Um, then I have some uh, different, uh, I have a different Wired interface, similarly because it uses the Wired interface. Uh, yeah, sh uh, wide profile, sure. Then I have some um, some uh, access points listed, like I in, po in our po uh, Ponies network, I want to connect. We're using normal uh, VPA2 uh, with a personal key, so it's very easy to define the SSID and the personal key. Um, at CCC, for example, it's pretty easy to handle the an anonymous authentication and the born hack is using the same setup. So we can, def we can just define what is the SSID and then define the parameters of the enterprise connection. It's pretty neat. Uh, we also handle like you have an open access point, just uh, set the SSID, it will automatically connect. Uh, it works pretty well with Ethereum, so if you have ever had any troubles with Ethereum, just use our tool because basically this will make you able to connect to it really quickly without any issues. A uh, quick demonstration. Uh, when you just run the tool, you can see the status of your connections. I'm connected to Bornhack right now. Since this is a list of my uh, profiles, if I wanted to connect to Bornhack again with a new identity because all my options are random, then now I will get a new host name, new MAC address, stuff like that. And basically, uh, if the connection isn't shit, then I will be able to connect. Not sure if it... We can also just scan to see if the connection is actually pretty bad here. Take some time. There we go. We can see like all the access points, stuff like that. And then we can basically just try and connect again. Hopefully it works. There we go. We are connected. We are associated. We are sending a DHCP request waiting for the response. And this is not the tool that's slow. It's basically just the network. So that's it.
these were all the lightning talks for today, but we have another session on Tuesday. So if you want to present something of your own, feel free to submit. The submission through the website might currently be broken, but you can ping me on IRC, I'm Celtophil, or just approach me at the camp. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>